So when I was in college, I had a close friend who invited me to join a fraternity in which he was a member. So I didn't know much about it, and before I made a decision, I wanted to find out what you have to do to get in. And so I did a kind of a uh, cost-benefit analysis. I wanted to see if the benefits would outweigh the costs, because there were some costs, I was told. For one thing, this was in upstate New York, it was in the winter. If you wanted to pledge, join this fraternity, you had to swim across a river in uh, upstate New York winter. Uh, if you saw one of the fraternity brothers on campus, you had to call him sir, you had to carry his books, you had to wash his car, all this kind of nonsense. And so I did this, as, as I said, I did this cost-benefit analysis. I don't know if I made the right decision, but at the time, I decided the benefits of being a fraternity member outweighed the costs, so I joined. Which leads me to this. Undoubtedly, there are some here today thinking about whether or not you should join Christ. I think in fairness to you, we ought to help you today to do a kind of a cost-benefit analysis. So we're going to be honest with you. And we're going to tell you about what it costs to follow Jesus, and then we're going to match it up next to the benefits of doing so, and you decide whether the benefits of following Jesus outweigh the costs. We do this because some people, I think, oversell being a Christian. They sort of say, if you become a Christian, life's going to be easy. You will avoid all the throes of life. Everything's going to be smooth sailing. Well, I haven't met a Christian who's had that experience. Not me, not those who I know. Life is tough, even for Christians. They're not immune from the pains and losses, suffering of life. So what we want to do in fairness is give you a kind of, uh, well, information so that you can give informed consent, the likes of which you do when you go to a doctor's office or if you seek counseling here at our counseling center, our director of counseling, Mike Schumacher and staff, they have deformed, uh, deformed, they have formed a, uh, a, uh, an information statement, a disclosure statement in which you'll read stuff like, if you go for counseling, it'll say the counseling you're going to receive is uh, clinically professional and distinctively Christian. And if you sign on the bottom line, then you know what you're getting into. You do that kind of stuff when you go to a doctor's office. So we're gonna do that now. We're gonna issue a kind of a disclosure statement. And so I first want to tell you what it costs to be a Christian. Three things. A Christian, number one, will suffer. That's, that's a promise. Second, a Christian will be stuck with difficult and different people. You need no faith to know this. Look to your right, look to your left. You have just proven my point. And then thirdly, a Christian is someone who will be, whether you like it or not, a servant. So then in sum, a Christian, think about this, if you want to become one, a Christian is a suffering, stuck servant. Would you like to sign up? Think about it as we delve into the text before us today. It's going to give you more information about this. We're in Ephesians today, chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. Look, for this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner... Wait just a second. Paul was like a Christian, not, not just a Christian, he was a super duper Christian. Good night, he says he's a prisoner. Right away, he's showing us that suffering is not inconsistent with sonship. He's a full-fledged member of Christ. And somehow that very thing caused him to end up in jail. He was an outspoken Christian. He told people about Jesus and the next thing you know, he's in chains. In fact, for two years, he was in jail in Jerusalem. Then they shipped him out north to a place called Caesarea. He's in jail there for a few more years. Then they put him on a boat that sails from Caesarea all the way across the Mediterranean Sea to Rome, where he was under a kind of a house arrest for another few years. Good night, this guy was in chains. His freedoms were lost. He couldn't do what he wanted to do. He couldn't go where he wanted to go. He was a prisoner. This Christian man, and that he was, was suffering. What did he do? He shared the gospel. 
good news about Jesus with who? People like you, Gentiles. You are responsible for Paul being in prison. It's all your fault. In fact, I can show this to you as we continue looking at verse 1 of chapter 3 in Ephesians. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, here we go, on behalf of you Gentiles. Because he shared the gospel with non-Jews, it got him in jail. Why? The Jews of the day believed only they could have close access to God. Think about it. It's kind of a form of ancient racism, wouldn't you agree? They believe we are the chosen people, which means everybody else ain't. Which means everybody else is marginalized and kind of a second-class citizen. And then all of a sudden, they find out, and Scott did a masterful job last week of showing us this in chapter 2. Suddenly, Jewish believers find out that Gentile believers can come to Christ on the same equal footing. No second-class citizens anymore in the body of Christ. But everyone, the field is leveled. Everyone comes to Christ by coming to the foot of the cross by faith. Well, Paul went about sharing that. And a number of the Jewish people didn't like to hear this. And so somehow, Paul ended up in jail so as to indicate all different kinds of people can come to Christ on the same basis at this time. Now, here's a question that popped into my mind when I was studying this text. Why does Paul write to them about the fact that he was a prisoner? Why does he say, I, Paul, a prisoner? What's the big deal? Well, it was a big deal. That was his inescapable present reality. Think about it. He's in bonds. He's in chains. So when he picks up his writing utensil, I don't know if it was a pen or I don't know what, a quill, whatever it was, when he picks it up, every time he makes a movement, the chains clank one against the other. He is painfully reminded of the fact that he is in bondage and that he is being subjugated in a Roman prison. So he doesn't deny the reality of his present circumstances when he writes to the Ephesians. He didn't want them to labor under the misconception that when you are joined to Christ by faith, when you become a Christian, you're gonna have no trouble. He wanted to give them a reality check. He wanted to be honest. He wanted to let them know being a Christian does not grant you immunity from suffering. And Paul has a kind of a perspective on suffering, which I think could be helpful to you and I if we get it. Take a look. For this reason, back to verse 1, I, Paul, look what he says, a prisoner of Christ Jesus. Well, when I read it, I thought, oh, man, there's an error in the Bible. He's not a prisoner of Christ Jesus. He's a prisoner of Rome. He's in bondage and being guarded by a Roman guards in a Roman prison awaiting trial by Roman officials. What's this deal, prisoner of Christ Jesus? Then I get it. Oh, my goodness. Paul realized the sovereignty of Almighty God. He said, I wouldn't have cho chosen to be in jail and have my freedoms denied me. I wouldn't have done that. But sovereign God who knows best has allowed it to happen. It must be for a good reason. He said, I'm not bound to Caesar, I'm bound to Jesus. Rome is not calling the shots, Jesus is calling the shots. Folks, I want to tell you something. Life is hard, do you know that? Oh yeah, it is. You and I have got, we can't escape it. Therefore, you and I have got to find a way to manage the stuff of life. If we think the circumstances of life are calling the shots just whimsically, we're going to be miserable people. They're not. We're not a prisoner of circumstances, no matter how harsh they may be. We're a prisoner of the Lord Jesus who either allowed them to happen or even specifically ordained that they would happen for a greater good we may or may not see this side of heaven. Folks, we are going to suffer loss. Christians will. Anything like that can befall us. But if we lose sight of the sovereignty of God, we will not navigate those waters in a good way. We're going to be miserable and robbed of peace and joy if we fail to see the sovereignty and goodness of God in all things. Paul, therefore, did not consider himself a prisoner of Rome nor of his circumstances. He considered himself a prisoner of Christ who is sovereign and good. 
but wait. Really? What's good about someone joined to Jesus being incarcerated on trumped up goofy charges? You tell me what's good about that. Then I thought about something. Think about this. If Paul wasn't in jail, I'll tell you what I think he would have done. He would have made fast tracks to a place called Ephesus because that's where the Ephesians lived. And he loved the Ephesians, the believers there. If he wasn't in jail, he would have gone to Ephesus to have a face-to-face -face meeting with the Ephesians to pray with them, to encourage them, to love on them. He couldn't do it, though. He's in jail. Therefore, he resorted to the next best form of communi communication, writing. So he wrote them a letter. You know what it's called? The letter to the Ephesians. Folks, we've been studying that for the last, I think, uh, 600 years. <laughs> he writes a letter to the Ephesians because he couldn't get to them face to face. You know what's good about this? You and I, 2,000 years removed from it, could read the letter. Do you know how many countless thousands of people throughout the millennia have benefited from Paul's letter to the Ephesians? Not only that, while in jail, he didn't only write the letter to the Ephesians, he wrote a letter to the Colossians, he wrote another letter to the Philippians, and he wrote a letter called Philemon. You can find it in the Bible. He wrote it while in jail. In fact, all of that stuff, they're called the prison epistles. Thousands of people throughout human history have benefited from it. Paul didn't understand why he's in jail, but Almighty God who is sovereign did, and Paul accepted the sovereignty of God. Because he was incarcerated, he had no choice but to communicate with God's help a letter that you and I have at our disposal even today. It is a good thing. So, folks, people, uh, Christians are people who indeed suffer. And secondly, Christians are people who are stuck together with one another, whether we like it or not, even difficult and different people. In the prior chapter, we saw how God joined together Jews and Gentiles. Folks, I got to tell you, in that day, even today, Jews and Gentiles don't have a lot in common. We eat different foods. We tell different jokes. Sometimes we wear different clothes. We come from different places. Uh, one group is better looking than the other. I didn't tell you which one. <clears throat> different. And yet these two different groups are joined together. It's quite mysterious. In the church as one. So for instance, look at some more verses in this text. Ephesians 3 verses 2 and 3. Assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can, when you read this, you can perceive my insight into the, here's the word again, mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Paul's talking about some mystery. What's the mystery? Uh, hidden from those in the past, but revealed now. Well, the next verse will tell us what the mystery is. Verse 6. To be specific, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, not just that, fellow members of the body, not just that, and fellow partakers of what? The promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Folks, the mystery revealed to Paul supernaturally is the church made up of Jews and Gentiles and all kinds of different people. That's the mystery, the church. In fact, it's so marvelous, Paul uses three terms to describe it. Look, fellow heirs. An heir is someone who inherits something. The inheritance for those joined to Christ by faith is the kingdom. And there isn't a kingdom inherited by Jewish believers and a different kingdom inherited by Gentile believers. No, we are fellow heirs, not just that, fellow members of what? The body of Christ over which he is the head, not just that, fellow partakers. 
Jews and Gentiles who become Christians share in all the promises of Almighty God. So the coming together of Jews and Gentiles, racially, racially different people groups, uh, is a mystery revealed. And it's so new that even Paul, get this, he has to in invent new language to describe it. So these three phrases, fellow heirs, fellow members, fellow partakers, are found nowhere else in the New Testament. This is the only place where those three phrases are mentioned. He said, I, 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 this is amazing. What are you talking about? Jews don't have anything to do with Gentiles. You can get cooties by hanging out with those people. We, don't, we live in different neighborhoods. We do different things. What, what, what? Jesus has made both groups into one. How do I explain it? I have to invent three different words in order to do it. The great mystery is that God has brought together Jews and Gentiles who believe to make up the church of God. It's such a great mystery uh, that I want to illustrate just how astounding it is. Uh, someone offered this illustration. It's a good one. Imagine that the government of the state of Texas decided it is going to have one flagship university, just one. Hey, by the way, let me ask you a question. If UT was playing, it's having a football game against a and I just wanted to figure this out. How many people here would root for UT? There you go. Hey, contain yourself, would you? And how many people would root for the Aggies? Holy moly. So imagine if the legislature of the state of Texas said, no, no, no more UT and A&M. We're going to merge both universities into one. How would you people get along? No way. It wouldn't happen. And that is nothing in comparison in Paul's day of Jews and Gentiles being merged into one. That's how big a deal it is. Now, folks, here's the deal. That's God's idea. That different people, people different than you, would be merged together in one family under God as co-equal heirs, members, and partakers of all he has to offer. It's called the church. The church is God's idea for reaching the world. The church is the most important institution on earth, and that's why you and I must preserve the unity of the church at all costs. Folks, there are times when we're going to have different opinions about things, different preferences, different ideas, and come from different places. That's all good. But it's not good if it drives a wedge between people groups Jesus died to bring together. We must preserve the unity in this local body at all costs. Folks, please notice, Paul suffered to do that very thing, to make sure Gentiles are uh, privy to the same privileges Jews are. We have to be willing, we have to be willing to sublimate ourselves for the sake of the greater concern, and that is the unity and harmony of this particular local body. I hope you see the importance of it. So in spite of our differences and difficulties, we have to preserve the unity of the body. Folks, look, we all have opinions, but something occurs to me. Just because you have an opinion doesn't mean you have to always share it. <laughs> Sometimes the best thing to do is just bridle your tongue, keep things to yourself. Sometimes sharing your opinions too liberally, ah, it just doesn't help. It's just divisive. It just divides us when in fact Jesus wants us to be together. Okay, so then, uh, uh, Christians are people who suffer according to God's sovereignty and who are stuck together according to God's plan and who finally serve according to God's grace. That's the point in our final verse for today, verse 7. Of this gospel, I was made a minister. That means servant. According to the gift 
Paul saw this as a gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. Now, I want to tell you something. If you're thinking of becoming a Christian or already are one, you're going to have a problem with that because nobody wants to be a servant. Nobody does. I mean, you ask little kids, uh, what do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be a policeman. Well, I want to be a fireman. I want to be a teacher. I want to be a nurse. One or two odd kids may say, I want to be a pastor. But no kid is ever going to say, I want to grow up to be someone's servant. Nobody. Nobody wants to be. Why? Because a servant can't come and go as he pleases. A servant's will has to be subjugated to the will of the servant's master. Nobody volunteers for that. It's unattractive. In the interest of honest self-disclosure, that's what happens. If you are joined to the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll be a servant. In fact, you'll be a servant not by choice of yours, but by his, as it says in verse 7. Paul said, I am this by the grace and power of Almighty God. In fact, it's so much God's idea and so important to him that those he embraces and adopts into his family serve him. I think that's the only thing he thinks about us. So you may be, I don't know, any one of those things. You may be a teacher, a policeman, firefighter, a, I don't know, teacher, accountant, student, whatever it is. I don't think that matters that much to God. Why? Because those are things you are by your own doing. You know what he's interested in? Who you are by his grace and power. If your life can only be explained on the basis of your achievements, how does he get glory? Therefore, if you're a Christian, your primary and essential identity is you are now a bondservant of Jesus Christ through which he gets the glory. That's what he did. So, uh, folks... You are not called to a specific vocation. I don't buy that. Let me tell you this. You weren't made for a particular vocation. You were made a Christian to serve God within the context of your vocation. Whatever it is you choose as a career is a platform by which you can serve and bring, bring glory to the God who saved you. That's the deal. So when the Lord saved us, folks, he moved in. He has a right to do that. And when he moved in, he came to give us the ability by his grace and power to serve him wholeheartedly and throughout eternity. So, Christians, once again, are people who suffer, who are stuck with one another, and who are servants. So why in the world would anyone want to be one? Well, let me share just a personal testimony. <clears throat> uh, I remember going to my first church. Weird. Who are these people? I don't recognize the songs. I don't know when to get up, when to sit down. What is happening here? This is just entirely different. And, and then they advertise stuff like, next Sunday will be the Lord's Supper. Cool. Cool. We get to eat. And you show up and they give you something like a little thimble. What is, why do I want to, why do I want to hang out with those? Who wants to be joined? What's up? So strange. So I thought through it. And I still, in doing a cost-benefit analysis, made a decision with God's help to accept him, to be joined with Christ. I'll tell you why. My suffering, whatever it is, since I became a Christian, is not in vain. My suffering before Christ was in vain. Most of the hardships I experienced were due to my own goofy, sinful choices. I brought stuff on myself. When I came to know Christ, whatever came my way, he has used for good. I must tell you, in affliction, I do best. I'm not asking for it. But in adversity, I do best. That's when you cling to God. That's when you draw near to him. That's when you search his scriptures. You're wounded. You need healing. I can tell you whatever I've experienced since I became a Christian, whatever hardships, losses, and 
so-called suffering has always been for good. Secondly, I can tell you my contact with other believers different than me has enriched me. Can I tell you something? I know what old, white, uh, Jewish, Yankees think. I are one. I just don't need to hang out with a whole bunch of people like me to figure out what that people group is thinking. I got it. But if I want to have my life enlarged, I want to hang out with different people so I could find out what makes them tick. Well, how do they hurt? So I can become culturally sensitive because we're going to be stuck with each other throughout eternity. Isn't that horrible? <laughs> Might as well get used to it right now by getting to know the diversity of people in the body of Christ. So I must tell you, it's been an enriching, life-enlarging experience for me. And finally, my service, I am a servant. My service of Jesus has been nothing but a privilege and a joy. I must tell you, before Christ, I did stuff. Most of it was in vain. It had no eternal significance. But now, in serving Jesus by making a deposit in the lives of those for whom he died, oh my goodness, it's of eternal significance. Think about it. God taking folks like us and giving us something to do that matters. It isn't that service in and of itself is a negative. It depends on who your master is. When your master is Jesus, it's a promotion to be called a servant of the king above all kings. And then finally this. John 5, 24. I memorized this verse some time ago because it told me something of the benefits of knowing Christ. Jesus speaks. Here's what he says. Truly, truly. There's no fat in the Bible, no extraneous information. So when something is repeated, you got to take note. When Jesus himself says truly, truly, he's saying this is true to the max. Truly, truly, I He's speaking, say to you. Now, the you is a different people group in the first century, but the you is you. You can put your name in there. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears, that's step one. Whoever hears my word, and step two, believes him who sent me, what do you get? Eternal life. That's a big benefit, folks. And there's more. He does not come into judgment. In, in, inherent in each of us is a fear of judgment. That's why we hide our sin. If we didn't fear having to give account, we would sin in the light. We wouldn't care. That's why, generally speaking, when someone wants to steal something from you, they try to do it when you're not around or when it's nighttime. I cleaned it up, babe. Did I get it right? I used the wrong term in the first service, and some law enforcement people here corrected me on it, which shows you how petty they are. <laughs> That's what I'm thinking. But here's the deal. Everybody knows inherently, uh, I don't want you to know what's really going on on the inside because you would judge me for it. This says one of the benefits of knowing Christ is you don't come into judgment, and there's more. You pass from death to life. What does that mean? Spiritual death to spiritual life. What can a dead person do for himself or herself? Nada. You're dead. So if you're spiritually dead, all you can glean from this world are its material benefits. You cannot lay hold of spiritual truths, realities, and benefits. Things like love, joy, peace, goodness, kindness, self-control, because those things are the fruit of the Spirit. If you're spiritually dead, you don't get those bennies. You mean to tell me a spiritually dead person, by hearing the words of Jesus and believing in them, can be resurrected, quickened, made alive from spiritual death so that we can be recipients of spiritual treasures that last throughout eternity? Yeah, I do mean to tell you that. I did a cost-benefit analysis to determine whether to join a fraternity and decided the benefits outweigh the costs. 
Will you do a cost, a reasonable cost-benefit analysis and consider the overwhelming benefits of accepting Jesus as your Savior and Lord? Folks, there are costs. We were honest with you. We didn't sugarcoat it. But the benefits of knowing Christ far outweigh the costs. Paul himself said somewhere else, for I consider, so he did a cost-benefit analysis. I consider, he said, that the sufferings of this present time, so he didn't sugarcoat it, he called it what it is. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that is to be revealed to us. He took account of the volume of the stuff he's going through, including being in prison. And he said, when I compare the quantity of my suffering to the quantity of glory, oh man, benefits far outweigh the costs. I want to encourage you, be a reasonable person. See that for yourself even today. And maybe pray something where you sit, the likes of which I'm going to pray right now. If what I pray is a reflection of what's on your heart. Pray after me. Would you bow? Let me pray. Lord Jesus, we bow. Why? Because you are high and lifted up. In bowing, we acknowledge your transcendence and also that from your vantage point on high, you see us, you know everything about us. Oh, God in heaven, would you search the hearts of those right now who have yet by faith to join themselves to you? Would you hear the heart cry and prayer of that person who says, Lord Jesus, I am not joined to you. I'm separated. Sin did it. My sin. But oh, God, I realize you dealt with my sin problem by taking it on you on the cross. You paid the price in full. He suffered and died and then good night won victory over death by rising from death for one such as me oh God I hear your word come to me all who are weary and heavy laden and I'll give you rest and I take you up on it Lord Jesus I come to you would you come into me changing me from the inside out I hear I believe I want to be an heir just as I am of eternal life I want to be free from judgment to come. I want to be resurrected from spiritual deadness to spiritual life. God in heaven, enable me to believe on you as my personal Savior and Lord. I choose to be joined to you today and forevermore. I've counted the cost, but the benefits of knowing you far outweigh them. Lord Jesus, I need you every hour. Lord Jesus, you are my one defense and my righteousness, and I am persuaded in spite of the cost. I need you. Thank you for joining us for this message from God's Word. We pray that the Holy Spirit spoke to you today, and if you would like to know more about a relationship with Jesus Christ, or you would like to connect with Sagemont Church, please text keyword online to 70919 anytime, any place. Once again, text online to 70919. One of our pastors will be happy to connect with you. Sagemont Church is located in Houston, Texas. Visit our website at sagemontchurch.org and join us for worship Sundays at 9.30 and 11.15 a.m. Central Time.